I work for the Natural Marine Fisheries Service in the Apex Predators Program, and in our program, we study basic biology and life history of sharks for input into management and population sustainability. We have three basic areas of research, the life history, which is age and growth, reproduction, and feeding ecology. We have distribution and migration studies, and that's part of our cooperative shark, day, shark dating program. We also do research surveys, and that kind of encompasses everything, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Since 1989, we've conducted 10 research surveys, um, and our coastal survey is the major source of fishery-independent data on sharks from Florida to Virginia. The primary objective is to provide an unbiased index of abundance for um, sharks in this area, and it also provides an, a platform for us to do life history and tagging studies. So as I mentioned, we started this in 1989. The survey is conducted in spring, basically biannually, but since it's obviously we should have had more, it's dependent on funding. We have 90 sets from Florida to Virginia that we do depending on weather in uh, 48 to 52 days. Those are broken into two to three week legs. And we are surveying coastal sharks, so we are going from 30 to uh, 240 feet. So the vessels that we take, uh, we used to take the Delaware II, which is this uh, vessel up here. Um, that's a research vessel, a government research vessel. We also sometimes use um, contracted research vessels, such as the University of Texas Longhorn. But our current vessels that we use is we contract um, commercial vessels. And the benefit of that is that they know how to fish. They do all the fishing. We give them very strict specifications, but we can devote ourselves to the science. So while we can't take as many scientists, um, we can concentrate on what we need to do. So just a little idea of life on board. Um, Sarah, who's, oops, wrong, whatever. <laughs> You'll see eventually. Um, this is Sarah. She's sitting in the galley and lounge area of Eagle Eye 2. And this is the other little lounge area that's actually my spot I let her sit in. <laughs> um, but you can see on the Delaware 2, it's much bigger. There's a big flat screen TV and a couch. They have Wi-Fi in every room and all this kind of thing. Um, so that's one benefit of the, of, oops, sorry of the uh, research vessels. Uh, additionally, though we have all the same electronics on both vessels for safety, um, obviously we have a big crew of officers on the Delaware II, whereas the Eagle Eye II has a captain. Much more casual, kind of nicer for us, really. <laughs> and then we have a very small um, cooking area on the Eagle Eye II, but as you can see by the, the turkey in the background, we can cook some really good food. <laughs> And most importantly, for the chief scientist, the chief scientist bunk. Um, you can see Sandra and Daisy on the large bunk in the uh, Delaware II, whereas um, Jason is actually standing above the bunk on the Eagle Eye II. It's <laughs> kind of a different lifestyle. At any rate, who do we take on these cruises? First of all, um, we take people from our own project because we have a lot of research to do, and um, obviously we know how to do it. Then we take graduate students, such as Heather and uh, Jeff, First choice is graduate students who need samples. Second choice is graduate students who need um, just opportunities to go to see and see what it's like. Occasionally, we'll take fisheries managers, get them out of their cubicles, and also to show them um, how we get the data, because our data inputs into their models. Daisy got to go a couple of times. <laughs> and this is next year's, part of next year's group for our survey. So how do we fish? Um, we use bottom long line, and basically that's exactly what it sounds like. It's a long line, okay? Again, it's a standardized survey. Everything's always the same, and anybody who's been on the survey, and there's a couple people here that have, will tell you that I'm a stickler for that. So it starts with a high flyer, which is a marker buoy, okay? And then um, it's weighted, so it stays on the bottom, and then we attach a series of Gangens, and what a gangen is is a 12-foot um, piece of monofilament with a baited hook at the end, and that's clipped onto the line. We have 300 of those interspersed with weights and marker buoys, and then finally we cut it and tie it off onto another high flyer, and it's anchored to the ground, so we're not attached to the boat in any way. So when we used to do it on the Delaware, this is how we would um, fish. We used dogfish or bait, and again with the standardized survey. 
we have to be very specific on how we cut the bait and how we bait the hooks. So the hooks are pre-baited waiting to be set. This is our um, drum that holds our line. And you can see how they're putting over the first high flyer, <laughs> followed by us giving the crew, what usually the crewman is the one clipping this onto the line, and we give him a specific set of, of um, ganges and, and weights. So when we bring it back, we do the exact opposite. Okay, we bring in the high flyer, we unclip the gangens, and if we get a shark and it's nice weather and it's a big shark, we'll bring it up in our sling. You can see we have people holding the shark down. That's for the shark's safety as well as ours. Now at this point, we can do any kind of non-lethal sampling you can think of. We can figure out what sex it is, we measure it, we tag it, we inject it with the antibiotic tetracycline for age and growth studies. Um, sometimes Heather would come out and take blood. We take the hooks out of these fish. We can take DNA samples, anything you can think of that's non-lethal. And then we release the shark and off it goes. If the shark is small, we can just bring it on board and do exactly the same thing. Now in bad weather or with really crazy sharks, we don't want to do that. So we have a pole, kind of like Greg and Megan's pole there. When we tag the shark remotely with the pole and then cut the gantrin as close as possible. <coughs> This is fishing. Sometimes things die when you catch fish. Um, for us, this is very useful for our life history studies because um, life history studies like age and growth, reproduction, and, and feeding ecology are very important uh, to learn about these shark species. And unfortunately, at this point, we learn about those through dissection. At some point, there will be non-lethal ways to do this, and right now, we don't have those. So uh, we don't kill sharks on purpose, but we fully take advantage of those that die. And we um, initially measure them. We get about 20 measurements off each fish. Then we weigh them and then dissect them. We take a little piece of backbone for aging studies. We take uh, measurements of all the reproductive organs. And we also take the stomachs. What we also do is that's when the other um, cooperator, cooperators, the other scientists come on, and they take what they need, which can be anything from parasites to other organs to fins to flesh anything you can imagine. And if they can't come on the boat, we will sample those for them and bring them to them because we want to flee the dead fish. So where does all this get us and why are we doing it? Well, over the course of these surveys, we have um, caught over 9,700 sharks of 19 species, okay? So right now we're currently analyzing all these data because it's, it's a long-term data set and we finally have enough data to do this. And we have found that there are six species that we see most often, and those are the dusky tiger, Atlantic sharpnose, black tip, scalloped hammerhead, and sandbar sharks. And you can see initially between 89 and 96, we had an initial decline. That's when the fishery was um, at its highest and before management. Once management came in, you can see that these indices are starting to go up. And this index is um, um, called it catch per unit effort, and not to get too much into Megan's math, it's sharks per 100 hook hours. So we, we know how many hours these hooks, uh, these um, hooks fish for, basically. So anyways, <laughs> this is a very simplified version. And um, we would take this, we would take our reproductive information and our um, other data, and we would give it to the Megans of the world, and they will put it into their demographic models and stock assessments, and hopefully um, figure out sustainable harvest for all these species. Thank you.